Hello, it's Scott Manley here. With the recent high-profile space joyride flights by Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, there's been a little bit of rivalry where Blue Origin are keen to point out that they fly higher than Virgin Galactic. But truthfully, neither of these come close to the altitudes achieved by Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom on Mercury Redstone. But it seems that there's another suborbital flight that carried humans higher and faster and further than any crew that never made it to orbit. It happened in the Soviet Union in the 1970s, and there wasn't any champagne toasts upon landing, mainly because it wasn't planned and there was nobody there to meet them. I'm of course talking about the high altitude abort of a Soyuz rocket on the way to space. In April of 1975, Vasily Lazarev and Oleg Makarov were assigned to what was expected to be called Soyuz 18 for a two-month mission to Salyut 4. They had previously flown together on Soyuz 12, which was the first flight after the Soyuz 11 tragedy. So they tested changes to improve the safety of the Soyuz on a two-day flight. They didn't know that they were about to make a more extreme test of Soyuz safety systems on this one. At about 5 past 4 in the afternoon local time, the booster lifted off from Baikonur and began its turn towards the northeast, aligning towards the orbit of the Salyut 4 station. The Soyuz booster from that era was still a first generation version. It looked broadly similar to what flies today, but subtly different. The core is slightly longer, but not that you'd notice without careful measurements. The Soyuz U upgrade had just been introduced in 1974 and was expected to fly the Soyuz half of the Apollo Soyuz pro test project later in that year. So the first stage boosters performed as expected, burning for about uh, two minutes before being depleted and then discarded, performing their signature backflip departure into the Korolev Cross. Then the fairing and escape tower are discarded to reduce mass. By this point, the rocket and the booster uh, are high enough that in an emergency, they don't need the high thrust engines from the escape system to safely separate the crew in an emergency. The core stage would now continue to burn up to about the 288 second mark. At that point, the core is depleted and the third stage ignites. Now the Soyuz use hot staging. That's where the upper stage engine will light before stage separation. That's one of the reasons behind the, the opus, open lattice work uh, on the interstage. The reason you do this is because lighting a rocket engine in zero G is unreliable because the rocket engines pull their liquid fuel from the tanks and they have to make sure they get liquid rather than gas. And in zero G, the gas could potentially end up at the bottom of the tank. So the engines are lit a little ahead of separation and then moments later, the booster shuts down and the stage separates. But the separation never happened right away. It remained attached. And without a clear path for those exhaust gases to go backwards, the vehicle started to twist out of its correct attitude. But you know, rocket exhaust is hot stuff. So something apparently gave way and the stage is probably separated. But with the rocket attitude being so far out of alignment, the control system shut the engines down and began an emergency launch abort. So the reason for the staging issue was that earlier in the flight, there was excessive vibration that had momentarily caused an electrical relay to close in the stage separation system. And that had triggered half of the stage separation pyrotechnics. There are six latches that hold the stages together and three were severed during this uh, anomaly. The pyrotechnics also severed the electrical connections that were needed to trigger the other half of the charges. So when the actual stage separation was commanded, nothing happened. Now from Lazarov and Makarov's point of view, they initially didn't notice any particular violence related to the failure. The vehicle just sort of pitched slowly out of the correct attitude. A booster failure alarm was sounded in the cabin and they felt the thrust drop to zero. Suddenly they were experiencing zero gravity. The automated abort system separated the Soyuz spacecraft, which uses, uh, then used its orbital maneuvering system to actually push itself away from the booster and prepare for return to Earth. Now, sources differ exactly how high and fast they were going, but what I think they were, well, they were definitely moving about four kilometers per second down range. Their altitude was probably about 145 kilometers and ascending towards Apogee. Now, over the next few minutes, the spacecraft continued to coast upwards to an apogee, probably about 192 kilometers. And then 
it began to fall back towards Earth again, picking up speed. During this time, the Soyuz separated into its three segments and oriented the descent module with the heat shield into the incoming atmosphere. Now, the Soyuz at this point had very limited abort guidance capabilities, and that didn't include the ability to steer the capsule to limit G-loading. And so it very likely just entered a simple roll to ensure that it was stable. They were a long way from orbital velocity, so the entry wouldn't be anywhere close to the intense heating experience during a regular entry, but the loss of thrust meant that they couldn't pick an ideal trajectory that skimmed through the atmosphere. And instead, they were heading downwards at a much steeper angle than any Soyuz had ever flown during entry. Normal Soyuz entry descends into the atmosphere at an angle of about 1.35 degrees. This was more like 15 degrees. On a normal uh, controlled entry, Soyuz experiences G-forces of about 5G. During a ballistic en uh, re-entry uh, incident in 2008, three crew from Expedition 15, including Peggy Whitson, experienced 8G. And those Mercury Redstone flights of Shepard and Grissom, those reached about 12. But the peak deceleration of this descent was a crushing 21.3G, which one of the crew members compared to being crushed by a car. But that wouldn't be uh, for very long. After that, the vehicle slowed down and reached the lower atmosphere. The parachute eventually deployed automatically, which was good because the crew were not in a good shape. But as the crew came to their senses, they couldn't get any response from ground control. Although one Russian source claimed that ground control could hear them perfectly. And it's said that Valentin Glushko was actually present and then did not take kindly to the crew's use of colourful language to describe the engine that they thought had failed. They were concerned uh, about exactly where they might be, you know, because um, the launch trajectory from Baikonur carefully skirts around the northern border of China, and if they were far off course, they could end up on the wrong side of that border, and relations between the countries were somewhat hostile at the time. Now, official sources say that they landed within the USSR, but of course the official sources would say that. From a physics point of view, however, it was very, it was never really off course. The third stage never burned for long enough to cause a kind of deviation that would bring them into China. So I think it's probably safe that they ended up in Soviet territory. Now, if they'd looked out the window as they were descending, they would see that they were coming down in mountains, and that brought its own dangers. The Soyuz, like most flying machines, liked to land in big, flat, open spaces. Instead, it landed on the side of a mountain, and the headlamp-shaped capsule began to roll down the slope until the parachute snagged on vegetation. Normal procedure in the Soyuz is for the crew to cut the parachute after landing, but I guess they took a look out of the window first to assess the situation, because following normal procedure would have been a disaster. Supposedly, they were more, no more than 150 metres from a dangerously steep section of the mountain. They were in the Atlai Mountains, and... Some sources even say that they were on a mountain designated Temeroc 3, uh, which would make them uh, put them about 1,600 kilometres downrange from their launch point. It was still very much the middle of winter, with chest-deep snow blanketing the terrain. The crew changed out of their suits into cold-weather survival gear, and due to concerns that they may be on the wrong side of the border, they burned documents relating to a military experiment involving tests of visual reconnaissance from the station. The cosmonauts would spend a night on the mountain before being rescued on April 7th. And very quickly, the world found out about this. The Soviet Union hadn't announced the launch beforehand, but they did share the failure after the crew was safe, and immediately they notified the US and began working to make sure the situation was understood. Because, of course, they were working towards the Apollo-Soyuz test project. And they were required to keep NASA informed and in the loop, because this could potentially jeopardise this joint mission. Now, it did lead to the follow-up flight uh, being on orbit, uh, working at the same time as uh, Apollo and Soyuz were making their historic meeting in space. The Soyuz half of this would also launch on the newer Soyuz U, which had a redesigned separation system. At least, that's what uh, NASA was told. The exact details of these changes aren't anywhere that I can find. They're probably in some old Soviet-era you know, archive, 
considered secret but not sufficiently important for people to rescue them from the vaults. Anyway, while Oleg Makarov would go on to fly two more Soyuz missions, Lazarov hadn't fared so well in the emergency. He never flew again and likely as a consequence of internal injuries sustained during those crushing g-forces in the descent. So with an apogee of 192 kilometers and a downrange distance of 1574 kilometers, this would make it the biggest suborbital flight by a human crew. For comparison, this was likely a few kilometers higher than Mercury Redstone and over a thousand kilometers further downrange. This also very much illustrates the dangers of unintentional suborbital flights with a crew on board. The so-called black zones where crew can be in real danger from the G-forces even if the ship holds together. And that's why Falcon 9 and Atlas V both use much shallower launch profiles to avoid the steep descent into the atmosphere if the engines fail uh, during flight. And of course, modern software means that they can actually avoid needing to do a ballistic re-entry and can fly it and reduce the G-loads. But yeah, in short, this was a record that the crew wouldn't have wanted to break. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.